None other than Hamza Shiraz. How are you, Hamza? He come over here when I had my first knockout in my debut. I was like, okay, cool. I could, could do something here. Didn't fancy life as a doctor or a lawyer. Nah, nah, <laughs> forget that. It's almost like your fresh meat and everyone wants a bit of you. They're all lining up to spar you. When you've got people such as myself doing good things for the community, it's, it's almost like giving hope. I've mentioned Amir's name. Last year, he fell out. Because it's a bit arrogant, to be honest with you, as a fighter. Which I thought was pretty random. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was that I did with, with him, yeah. 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 Hello and welcome back to One on One Boxing with me, your host, Rob Tebbett. As always, I'd like to remind everybody to please like, comment and subscribe. Turn your notifications on for more boxing content. Now that's out of the way, we are back for another episode of One on One with a man who needs no introduction. I think one of, if not the hottest prospects, contenders in British boxing now, although you kind of like USA and British boxing now yeah. because you're based over there, but none other than Hamza Shiraz. How are you, Hamza? Very well, Rob. Yourself? I'm very well, thanks. Very well. Ooh, just uh, going to grab my coffee there. No um, <laughs> but yeah, no, not too bad. Thanks for coming in today. No, thanks for having me. Thanks for having managed me. to catch you in um, in one of your, your jaunts over here before you head back over to LA and uh, soak up some of the sunshine over there. You've been out in kind of doing your camps in America now, working with Ricky Funes yeah. and being based over there for a little while now. How yeah. are you enjoying it? How, it feels like you probably settled there now yeah this the first this was the first time i actually felt like it was kind of home going to into my fifth camp with ricky now i'm the first three four camps everyone just asking me to repeat myself because 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 of my accent and and whatnot but no it's good i was getting getting used to the food getting used to the gym getting used to the people there and now i've got my routine like five it took me five fights in ricky's understanding me i'm understanding ricky and it's like I said, it's, a, it's definitely becoming a second home and I see myself providing everything goes goes to plan. I see myself there for the foreseeable future. I was just surprised that they couldn't understand your accent. You got a pretty, like, pretty, you know, pretty uh, traditional accent. I know, accent I know, I know. They, they thought I was like Apu out of the Simpsons or, so, or, so, or, so, or something like that. Always, always asking me to repeat myself, but they're picking up on it now. All right, before we are, we're going to go back and just talk about kind of your, your journey to this yeah. point and what you, you kind of hope for in the future. But as we've discussed about um, LA and being trained over there, let's, yeah. start, let's start there, start yeah. in the middle and then yeah. go back and then and carry on. Yeah. Um, talk to us about the reasons why you decided to, to move over there because it's, it's not something that we really have that often over here. Yeah. We're kind of like a highly touted prospect like yourself. Mm. And you have, you know, great deal with Frank Warren and yeah. boxing on BT and it all seems quite, comfortable yeah. but that's probably a reason why it might be good for you to go, to over go out there your comfort so what it was from a young kid i don't know it, america the usa and boxing always appealed to me not necessarily not necessarily i mean like fighting out there but just training out there because oh, from a young kid what you watching youtube videos of floyd mover uh, oscar de Hoya, all these guys and you, you're seeing it and then i got amir khan's uncle taz working on board with me and he always used to say he always used to say it to me Listen, out there is, is is a different level of training, and he always used to say it, but it never really registered until I got there. And when I got there, and I sampled my first two weeks of training, I remember getting back, lying down on my bed, and thinking, "Yo, this is this is different, man. This is hard." And like I said, I'm becoming more accustomed to it now, and I think that's what it was. I'm not not to say that over here it doesn't appeal to me, nothing like that, of course, because I am fighting here, and I've got my my fan base and my support here, and that's obviously the main thing, but. It was just the training out there and getting away from the distractions over here because sometimes you don't even realise you're getting distracted. Like you go out with your with your mates mid-camp and I don't know, you end up somewhere you're not really meant to be. Just these little things like that, really. So that was one of the main reasons I, I kind of moved myself out there. When you went into the gym for the first... We had Dan Aziz in not yeah. long ago. Obviously, he trains with Buddy McGirt out yeah. there. I spoke to Luke Campbell in the past. And they yeah. sort of say, like, when you go over there, they hear the British accent. I mean, it's a British-ish, apparently, yeah. for you. Um, and then they go, oh, lovely, a British guy over here. It's different over here. Because yeah. like, Americans, we could say this, so we'll yeah. shout out America, but anyway, they all think British fighters can't fight. Yeah. So when you come over there, they expect you to be, no matter what your record is, I was yeah. a British fighter, yeah. this is a different level. Did you get any of that when you yeah, first you, went there? What you just said, they they have that, I don't know what it is, they think that automatically, and you, as a British fighter, you have that stigma attached to you as you walk into the gym. So when I was going to Justin Fortune's gym, when I was going to Wildcard gym, it's almost like you're fresh meat and everyone wants a bit of you. They're all lining up to spar you. Because you're going to be you, out in America, you spar people two weights above you and two weights below you and, and people your same weight. So the sparring out there was unreal. I remember walking into uh, into um, it was Justin Fortune's gym for the first time. This was my first ever sparring session in America. Uh, two years ago, I sparred uh, Peter Kamukov. He's a Russian amateur, one of the best fighters out there. And I remember walking in the gym, was boiling hot. 
and everyone just stopped and looked like who's this a lanky kid walking in <laughs> walking in the gym sparring one of our best friends the whole gym just stopped honestly the whole gym just went silent and we went out for about eight rounds had good eight rounds of sparring and that was like my introduction to then and it slowly got easier and easier when i say easier it got less hostile that's what i mean but yeah, definitely we have that stigma attached to us going over there. Do you feel like you, when you go in there, you have to like prove yourself as well? You feel like, oh, I'll show these guys I can fight. I'm not it just was, a British bum. Yeah, it was, it, was like, it was like that at the start, the first two or three camps. But now everyone out there knows who I am. They know I train with Ricky. If, and they tune into my fights as well. Like They don't ask to say, oh, we yeah, watched your fight. You've done well, blah, blah, blah. And it's all paying off. And at the same time, what you've got to remember is I'm, as that's happening, I'm slowly building a name for myself out there. So, I mean... If I do have to go out there one day and fight for a world title or defend a world title, it won't be nothing new to me. I've been going, I went to the Fury World of Free Fight over there, sat ringside, and it was a great experience for, experience for me. So I'm picking up all these little things out there. Outside of uh, the boxing gym, I appreciate you know, you're, a, you're a professional fighter. Yeah. And you don't get, a, you know, you're not going to Disneyland and <laughs> these, these sorts of things. But what do you do away from the gym while you're there? Do you know what? I have, what I train Monday to Saturday, three times a day, and then I have the Sunday off. And when it comes to the Sunday, I'm normally knackered. So I'm just, I literally do nothing. It's as simple as that. I do nothing. Or if I do do something, I'll go out, I don't know, to a little restaurant and just have a little cheat meal and treat myself or, or something like that. But honestly, it's as boring as that. Everyone thinks, yeah, oh, LA is great. I, I, even I had that perception. I'm going to go there, beaches, you name it, palm trees and whatnot. But it's the total opposite of that. And especially where the gym's located. It's located in, in the valley side, so like in the much rougher area of of la so but yeah no complaining man it is what it is <laughs> you went over there and worked with ricky funes what was it about ricky that that tempted you into a, to go and train with him Do you know, really truly speaking if it was up to me and i had to pick i probably wouldn't even pick ricky really and truly but what it was was he come over here when i was still training with will jones at edge gym and taz called me he goes oh there's a trainer from america from tengu boxing gym um he said come over and we'll do we'll do do a session and I remember this was my time off. I think it was after I won my first, my first uh, fight. And he goes, come out, come out to where was it? It was in Kent. He was staying in Kent. That's it. And he goes, come out, do a session with him. Just see how you find it. It'll be a bit different. And I remember I done a two-hour session with him. And what I learned in that two-hour session, I carried on for the next like three fights. And then when I had the funds to go out there, I will give Ricky a call. I said, do you mind working? He goes, no, come out, let's do it. And then here we are today: five fights, five wins, five knockouts. What type of uh, character is Ricky? He's all right. He's very, um, in LA, he's a little celebrity. You know what I mean? Because he was obviously chained Justin Bieber and all these singers and actors and you name it. So out in LA, he's a little celebrity, but he, he knows what he's doing. And the good thing about me being being one of the first fighters he's actually worked with, not being under Joe Goosen, mm. he's almost got a point, a point to prove as well. Like, I'm not just someone's understudy. I can do this myself, so... It all works in my favour, to be fair. Joe knocking about the gym? Yeah, I, he's I'd there every day. Yeah, he's yeah. there. So he trains his fighters at the same time as as uh, as I train there. So I pick up pointers of him. I pick up pointers of the other coaches in the gym. And it's all just, I look at myself, obviously, yeah, as a sponge and just soaking everything up. You pick up any fashion tips from Joe Goosen? Any yeah, he's got, any he's got a, he loves his denim. He <laughs> loves his denim, <laughs> doesn't he? And, and his converses. I was chatting to him actually two weeks ago. Uh, sorry, about three weeks ago when I was there, I go, every time I come to the gym, I go, you just dress better and better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, um, he's, he's sort of the ageless uh, Joe Gooser. He's going to be going on forever, I think. Uh, was it always boxing for you? I mean, I know that you kind of like, you, you've got boxing in the family, but I yeah. know you also, your dad played cricket. Yeah. And, you know, it's not something that's a huge thing in the community. You know, the, the Pakistani community, kind of boxing is not, you've had Amir Khan in yeah. recent years, and yeah. obviously there's been one or two others, but... Yeah. It's not. I'm always quite interested to speak to people from, you know, not the conventional communities, I guess, in boxing about what drove them towards getting punched in the face. Really, literally, yeah. yeah. It's as simple as that. Isn't it? <laughs> um, like, like you said, it was in the family, and cricket was my first sport. To be fair, because my dad used to play and whatnot. But then I remember we got there was an opening day of some gym in in Loughton, and I went down there, and then I remember walking to the gym, and I'd done a session there, and I just never looked back, and then. Obviously, the the whole role of it being in my family kind of kind of made sense. But when you're a kid, you don't really understand that. It's more you're doing it for the fun. You're doing it for something to do. And I think when I was younger, I was just doing it for fun. Really, I was doing it for fun. And then as you get older, it gets more it gets more and more serious. And you start understanding why you're doing it and what you're doing it for. And then you go through certain things in life that make it much more of a 
of a uh, lifestyle and much more of a of a reason to do why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I think for a lot of fighters who I speak to over the years, it come, there comes a point where they realise they're actually pretty good. Yeah. And then they think, oh, actually, I could maybe do this. When was that moment for you? That was when I, after my pro debut. It wasn't even the amateurs because I wasn't a standout amateur. Mm. I had, uh, nearly had 100 fights. I didn't win no national titles. Uh, I went to a few England camps. I was meant to get picked for a few uh, Tri-Nation tournaments and whatnot because I was always getting to the finals and I never actually won a, won a national title. But... It was when I had my pro debut and when I when I had my first knockout in my debut, I was like, okay, cool, I could could do something here, you know what I mean? I look at my support, I sold like 500 tickets for my debut and I thought, okay, we could go about it here and here we are. <laughs> were you always a tall kid? When no, you were... I wasn't, I wasn't. I had a, about 16, I had a crazy growth spurt and then I just, and then I had another growth spurt when I was 18. Hopefully it'll stop now, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was gonna say. Otherwise I'll get into basketball or something. <laughs> yeah. Any more growth spurts, I think it'd be pretty difficult for you to make middleweight <laughs> anytime soon. Um, so you kind of, you made your way through the amateurs and I know I've kind of, I've done, you know, look yeah. back at your, your kind of your amateur career and, and what you've done, yeah. what you did in the amateurs. Always professional boxing, was that always kind of the, the aim for you? Yeah, it was. It was obviously when I was a youngster, I mean, the Olympics was, but as I was getting older, it was, the dream was just going out, out of reach and, if you're not in the England squad from about 13, 14, I don't. There's not a chance you're gonna you're gonna get in it. To be fair, but yeah, it was always pro. Pro always appealed to me. Watching, like I said, these May over twenty four sevens, these HBO documentaries as a kid, and you see all the all the lavish lifestyle they live, and and what boxing at the peak is actually really like. And when I turned over pro, it's almost like I had to pinch myself because like this is what I wanted to do, and this is what I'm doing now. So yeah, that was that was always the aim. What fighters did you like watching growing up? Floyd Mayer was one of them. But to be fair, it wasn't so much actually watching them fight. It was more watching them away from the ring of how they lived their lives and how they used to train. Like I said, the HBOs, I was like, I've watched all of them. The Showtimes, mm. the HBOs, I've watched every, you ask, you name it, I've watched all of them. And that was what appealed to me as a kid. But then obviously, as you get older, you understand that there's a lot more to it. What happens to what happens inside the ring as much as there is to watch what happens outside. Family supportive. I mean, like I'm, a, I'm a parent, and yeah. you know, if my daughter one day you know, just said, oh, "I want to box," I'd be like, "No, leave out. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but obviously, with, with it kind of running in the family, I'm, I'm assuming it was slightly different, or was it? Uh, I've always had my family support. I always, always had my family support. At the time, I think there's a stigma attached to, especially the South Asian community, of growing up to be doctors, yeah. lawyers, and you name it, to go through that educational route, but. With me, it was never that. It was never that. It was always whatever you do, regardless of what it is, whatever you want to do, just make sure you stick at it 100 percent and and um, don't do it half heartedly. So, and boxing happened to, to be that sport. Didn't fancy life as a doctor or a lawyer. Nah, nah, forget <laughs> that. I didn't. Have, you know, when it comes to school, I wasn't that academic. Coming to English, I was good, but numbers and that, I'm a I'm a disaster. As long as I can count, that's all that happens. That's yeah, all that exactly. matters, isn't it? You can count the checks. Yeah, man. that's, that's it. Right. Yeah, you don't need to worry about anything else. Um, when did you first meet Frank Warren? When did I first meet Frank? I first met Frank at my debut when he was sat ring ringside with Tyson Fury when he when he was when he was making his comeback when he was at his biggest. I remember he was sat ringside and then after the fight he touched my glove. He's like, yeah, he goes, you got something about you, and then. Then I saw Frank and I was a bit like, oh, what do I say? What do I say? Like, what do I do? And it, when you see him growing, when you grow, growing up, you see him on TV f promoting all these fighters. And when he's promoting you, like I said, it's a bit surreal. But now I'm obviously going to the Arsenal games and whatnot with him, and I have built that relationship, and it's all good now. What's he like away from the cameras? I mean, I know Frank. Obviously, I've yeah. worked, worked a long time yeah, Frank yeah, yeah. throughout the years. But I think for people who are watching this, yeah. they would have never had a private conversation with him. Yeah, What's yeah, he yeah. like? No, he's alright. He's top. He's, he's, he's a top guy. So you almost have this expectation of them to be something that that they're actually not. They're just normal people, and and that's it. Away from the cameras, just just a normal guy. He's a nice guy. You mentioned there about kind of the, the support that you've got and it is like a big part of the, the kind of the South Asian community that you just mentioned there yeah. really do back their own. And yeah. I remember I've you know, been at some of your fights where yeah. it's like, oh, bloody hell, like this is unbelievable. Adam Azim, another one, yeah. kind of all the Azim brothers coming yeah. out of Slough, like yeah. huge community behind them. That must make you feel so proud. I mean, obviously Amir years ago kind of bringing through sort of a new wave, a new generation behind them, like yourself and Adam yeah. must feel such like a, you know, a sense of pride and not well, responsibility, I guess, for the yeah. community and for the people who are there to, to support you. Yeah, no, 100%. Like, 
you hit the nail on the head there is you do get that sense of of achievement especially being from a south asian background because listen if you, if you look at the area i live in and the areas i've got i grew up in and the area i was born in predominantly knife crime is is led by the south asian community so when you got when you got people such as myself doing good things for, for the community it's it's almost like giving giving hope giving hope to our, to our community and making it a much more of a of a of a popular thing to to succeed rather than go down the wrong route so as long as i continue to be an ad advocate for that I'm, I'll, I'll be a happy man i imagine you probably had people were messaging you saying oh hamza you know i saw you boxing now yeah. or my son he wants to go yeah. to the gym so he wants you get to be loads like of that. you yeah, you yeah. get loads of, especially for, especially from the parents like i've had a few my sons got into boxing because of you and when you hear it you're like mm me like you're like what oh, really and then then you actually see the kid in the gym and you actually see them coming through the amateur ranks and it's like oh because of you he's doing what he's doing and like i said at the time when you hear it you don't you don't believe it until you see it and uh, yeah hopefully that will continue now i've mentioned amir's name yeah um who's somebody who, of course you know, achieved a, an awful lot both yeah. as an amateur and as a professional yeah last year he fell out yeah which i thought was pretty random it was yeah, actually yeah. An it was i did with, with him yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah i did an interview with him and i said oh what did you think to hamza and then he went oh yeah nah, no and i was like oh i didn't expect that answer obviously since you know you have kind of yeah. squashed the beef yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. It, which is great to see i, mean, I don't yeah. think it's ever good to see anybody certainly from you know different generations of fact, you literally know, yeah, never yeah. gonna fight i know there was discussions at yeah. one point or like certainly on the camera about it, but you know it's always good to see people encouraging each other but what happened there i could ask you the same question because i remember you i remember coming after the fight in the training room and they go oh this interview blah 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 and i was like well i was a bit confused at the time and then obviously the back and forth happened and to be honest from my point of view i was i was like loving it i was getting the most most attention i've probably ever got and um, i was getting followers and as much as you're getting hate i was getting followers so mm. it didn't really matter and um uh, yeah, no, then, then I thought, hang on, like, why is this even happening? People were asking me and I couldn't give them an answer. So then um, we kind of reached out to him and then I went over to Dubai not long ago and I just sorted out of him. And then they found out that just certain people talking certain nonsense and just there was a miscommunication between me and him and, and that was it really. It was, it was as simple as that, as most problems do happen via someone else. That's exactly what it was. Particularly in boxing. So he said this and she, she and said it, that. It becomes so, like, it becomes, it becomes so distorted by the time it actually reaches something. You make a mountain out of a molehill, wouldn't it? Yeah. That's, exactly, that's exactly what it was. And when it come down to the crux of things and we sorted it out, it was like, is that it? Like, and that's it. So we sorted it out and then that's it. it like, like I said, happy days. So it's good. It's good to hear. Obviously, we've kind of since seen that. And I know it's kind of like yeah. something that's in the past now. But I was, yeah. I was very curious as to what happened and how things kind of came to, to be reconciled. But yeah. it's good because, I mean, I'm sure you're growing up, you'd have seen Amir as kind of a source of inspiration yeah. and somebody kind of paved the way, Literally, as yeah. it were. So it's never good to see people falling out over for silly things. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, especially being from the, from the same background, you know, people... Are, we're a bit confused as to why why it's happening and what's happening, but like I said, it, it is what it is. I think the only thing I can do from now is look at it, look at it as as a life lesson, use it as a reference point for for the future or for for people who um who need advice in the future. So go, go go look at that interview and then look at the interview I done afterwards and then see. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so no catch weight fight anytime. No, nah, no catch weight fight okay. any soon. I think. A few more fight, a few more fights. So I'll be like heavyweight or something. Like that. <laughs> but probably for the next, I reckon, two years, I'll hold middleweight. It's that division that's kind of in limbo at the minute. Mm. There's no one actually dominating. I don't know who knows. I could be the puncher in one of the one of the punches in the middleweight division. Bradley Skeet. Yeah. How much did you learn from that fight? That fight was a blessing in disguise, really and truly. Now I look back on it, you start winning comfortably. You kind of forget these things, and then it takes a fight like that to wake you up. All, all the um, all the hate and all the. Um, people just all, all the online abuse and whatnot. It was at the time. I remember it was, it was there was loads of it. There, there, there's respect there, but I think personally, for me, you can never really respect the man who's trying to take food off the table. Do you know what I mean? You can never really until you've shared the ring and you've settled your disputes and you realise you you understand who the better man is. I think not until then there won't be the respect that there should be. How are you with the weight? Because I remember like yeah. seeing you, seeing you. So I always used to say that the fight that I really wanted to see for no other reason than I just wanted to see it was yeah. you and Sebastian Fandora. Yeah. You've just been great. Like just seeing you both at, when you were 154 yeah, especially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you must be, I mean, even though you're at middleweight, yeah. I mean, you're a big lump. Yeah. Um, how are you with the weight? How are, where do you see kind of yourself settling and where do you see yourself ending up? Because you're still very, very young. You're still growing. Yeah, so like, still a lot of maturing to do. Still a lot of muscle muscle muff growth growth to happen but as for now for probably for the next i reckon two years i'll hold middleweight i want to pl plan to fight for a world title at middleweight 
Um, but yeah, you never know. You never know. I could have. You, you just have. Like sometimes overnight, you you try and make the weight in a camp, and you're not hitting the targets that you was hitting. I don't know two fights ago. So that's when you have to start start considering to move up. But at the minute, one sixty for for the next two or three years, I reckon I'll be able to to hold it at quite comfortably as well because. The only time I blew up was this camp was after I had my hand operation because I couldn't really do anything. I couldn't punch. I could run, but I mean, how long can you run for? You know what I mean? I couldn't swim. I couldn't do nothing like that. But now I've got down back to close to fighting weight and I'm a happy man. It's a good time to be middleweight as well. Banging on the door at middleweight. It's kind yeah. of like the post Gennady Golovkin era. Yeah. Like Canelo's obviously up at well, yeah. super middleweight. We've dipped his toe in at light heavyweight and what have you. But it kind of feels like middleweight now is there for somebody to go and claim it. For taking, yes. It is. I was having this discussion not long ago, actually. It's, it's that division that's kind of in limbo at the minute. Mm. There's no one actually dominating and all the belts are going to be up for grabs if Charlo moves up to fight uh, Canelo. The WBC will become vacant as well and there'll be a few vacant belts at, at middleweight. So I reckon within the next two, maybe touching three years, you'll, you will see who the top boys at 160 really and truly are. You a little bit of like, ah, oh, so you won't get, probably, well, I don't know, you never know with Gennady Golovkin, but you yeah. don't get to mix it with a Gennady Golovkin yeah. or a Canelo Alvarez. Like five years ago, middleweight was was, was really strong. It you was know? the division, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But whereas now it's kind of like, I mean, it's great for you because there's opportunity exactly. there, but you're maybe not going to get the, the big triple G fight, which, yeah, is, no, which I is mean the one. I mean, you'll get a few of them coming through. Do you know what I mean? You'll get a few of them coming through. And I think once I, once I start getting the recognition and once I start fighting a step up in fighters and as long as I start knocking them out and continue my knockout streak, I don't know who knows I could be the puncher and one of the one of the punchers in the middleweight division going back to a, a couple of your fights down at 154 in yep. particular uh, Bradley Skeet yeah how much did you learn from that fight loads loads as much as I learned inside the inside the ring I learned outside yeah. the ring as well because that fight was a blessing in disguise really and truly now I look back on it because what I was breaking down the fight itself, what I was doing was I was following him. It was as simple as that. I wasn't breaking, I wasn't using my jab number one and I wasn't um, cutting, the cutting the ring off, which is simple things in boxing. But once you start, sometimes once you start winning comfortably, you kind of forget these things and then it takes a fight like that to wake you up. And that's exactly what it done. Um, it woke me up and we, wor we worked on certain things in the gym. And since that fight, I think my, I think my performances have been getting better and better after each fight and outside of the ring which to deal with all, all the um all the hate and all the um people just all, all the online abuse and whatnot it was at the time i remember it was it was there was loads of it threats this that the other no one done nothing and no one said nothing to me in person but it just comes to that that cyber that cyber kind of like not bullying but that cyber hate and that cyber just dumbness really and truly but you learn how to overcome these things and I'm a mentally strong, strong person, so it wasn't too bad. But if you're, if you're not, it could really get you down in the dumps. Yeah, it still must have not been particularly easy. You'd have been 22, I think, maybe at the time. You're 24 yeah, now, aren't you? Yeah, 24. Now. So about yeah, two years been, ago. Yeah, 22. Yeah, 22 at the That's time. Not something so. for any 22 year old. Yeah, and I remember, like, I thought, you know, what, I'm gonna book a holiday and get away from this, and I'm going to the uh, uh, the Grand Prix in Abu Dhabi, and then. I thought, yeah, I'm away from it all now, and I got there and I got asked the same questions by people over there, so I was like. Oh. You can never really get away from these things, but I just had to learn how to deal with it. And like I said, looking back at now, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 never good to go through something where you're getting stick and getting loads yeah. of abuse from people. But as long as you can take the right lessons from it, and look, you're you're in the the public eye. You want to be a world champion exactly. one day. No matter what happens, people still a lot of people always talk about Mayweather yeah. and the fact that Mayweather didn't do this. Mayweather, was, you know, he, he did all right. That's the yeah. thing about boxing; it's full of opinions. Isn't yeah, it? and you can't. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. You just got to. Just take take just take it as it is and just get on with get on with life. Denzel Bentley, what's going on there? I've you know I've got a lot of time for you. I've got a lot yeah. of time for Denzel. It yeah. seems like a natural ish fight to make. Yeah, You're both 100%. kind of you know, on the edge of the. I know he's boxed for a world title. And yeah. You're kind of looking to get up there as well. Seems like a, a natural fight to make. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Like I said, it's one of the the easier fights to make in in the division, especially being under the same promoter. And I remember at the time. I was saying, yeah, let's let's do it for the British. But really and truly, now I'm reflecting on it. It is much bigger than the, than the British. Maybe it will happen end of the year or, or early next year for for an eliminator, eliminator, or if he wins the world title before that, or if I do, it'd be a good good defense. But that's a like you said, it's a rivalry. That's 
it's it's very natural. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing's forced on on both ends. It's a very natural um, rivalry, and one I'm definitely looking forward to 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 making happen. Mutual respect there. Both respectful guys. Yeah. But it doesn't always mean that you'll like each other. Or yeah. No, it doesn't always mean. That. Especially, you know, it's natural competition. And I know, I know people say. Yeah, there, there's respect there, but I think personally, for me, you can never really respect a man who's trying to take food off your table. Do you know what I mean? You can never really until you've shared the ring and you've settled your disputes and you realize you you understand who the better man is. I think not until then there won't be the respect that there should be. But I mean, that's that's all for the better. That's all for better for the public and and for the fight. What did you make of his performance against Janibek? It was a good performance. It was a good performance. Did I expect him to go twelve rounds with him? No, I didn't. I'll be honest with you, I didn't. And did I expect him to come on strong? No, not at all. So, his like I said, his, from that fight, his stock has risen. His stock has risen, and if he gets the re rematch, who knows what will happen? But yeah, no, it was a good, it was a it was it was for what it was, it was a good performance. We mentioned uh, Jamal Charlo earlier, obviously WBC middleweight champion. It yep. looks as though he's going to be boxing Canelo. Yep. Uh, obviously, no official announcement yet. But yep. what do you make of that fight if it happens? Yeah, how long any box for? Two years? Yeah, about now. Yeah, a long time. How are we still middleweight champ? WC middleweight champ? I had no, I have no idea. Yeah. Especially not defending for that long. Boxing. Yeah, <laughs> it's what it is, isn't it? <laughs> but um, I see, I see Canelo beating him quite comfortably. I don't see it being an issue. Maybe late stoppage. But you know what? When it comes to boxing predictions, I'm not the man to listen to. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not listening. If you're a betting man, do not come to me. <laughs> Um, just before we kind of move on and talk about some other things, one thing I'd like to talk to you about is your faith. Yes. You are a Muslim, yep. practicing Muslim. Yep. How much of your, you know, your faith, how much does your faith give you from a, from a sporting perspective and a personal perspective? Yeah, no, listen, it's always played a massive role, not just in boxing, but in my life in yeah. general. You know what I mean? Growing up when things have been tough and you have nothing to, got to fall back on, you always have religion to fall back on, you always have faith, you always have God to fall back on and just sometimes in life when you don't have that hope for me that was always my my last bit of hope and you always used to go go back to even now even now when things are not going my way or whatnot I just pray to God and pray that thing, things will get better for in 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 my benefit of course but um it the good thing about my about being a Muslim and boxing is it they teach very similar core values very similar core values to respect your your elders to just be a respectful person to always to always listen and 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 be be peaceful and whatnot. So they they coincide with each other and it's 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 a lot easier for myself. The day to day kind of practicing of Islam. We have Ben Faruqi here. Big up yep. Ben Faruqi. Uh, yep. Obviously another practicing Muslim. What's your your day to day? How often do you go to mosque? What's kind of the the day to day for you? Yeah. So my day to day to day to day would be. Obviously, as Muslim, you meant to pray five times a day. If I sat here saying I pray five, five times a day, I'd be lying. I do try my best and I go to mosque, obviously, once a week to, to pray Friday prayers and whatnot. But listen, at the end, I'm always trying my best to become a better Muslim. And um, especially being a role, a role model to certain kids, you want to promote your faith, especially if they're, if they're Muslim as well. So I'm just at the end, trying to be the best person I can be. It's as simple as that. And um, uh, that chap there, you can't see him there, but Muhammad Ali, yep. also a former former fighter who yes. was a was a, a Muslim, probably the highest profile of his probably of his generation. Uh, he was a hero in my house when I was growing <laughs> up. So I I was told this story a few times where like you know how like usually in the living room you get like the photos of the family and stuff like yeah, that well, yeah. you have Muhammad Ali? my dad had like a pencil <laughs> sketch of Muhammad Ali and yeah. one of Sugar Ray Leonard oh, okay. so yeah uh, mum was very pleased about that that's yeah. probably why they split up but anyway <laughs> um, but how much of a, of a source of inspiration was Muhammad Ali to you growing up or, or throughout your professional career as well that, yeah like, like not just me just everyone yeah. everyone like there was he was relatable to everyone he was, very, mm. he was a very personable person he was relatable to everyone and the way he carried himself, what he stood for, in terms of history as well, not just just faith in history, was he was a, ma a man of the people, and that's so someone I would like to be. Whether it happens, I don't know. Will it happen? Who knows? I tr like I said, I'll try my best. But yeah, definitely someone who who I, who I, who, I, who I look up to and who most people look up to. To be fair, mm, absolutely. Uh, so away from boxing, what would you like to get up to, Hamza? I'm a very simple guy, Rob. I'm a very simple guy. I'll, what do I do away from boxing? I like to eat. Yeah, me too. As most boxers do, right? Because we're always dieting. Uh, I like to travel. <laughs> like to travel, um, and just chill out. Really, I'm, like I said, simple guy. I don't. There's not something I do away from 
boxing us like oh what he does that as well play a bit of tennis here and there a little bit of tennis and yeah that's about it that's about it I should be a good tennis player you've got the height yeah big, like, um, big smash serves <laughs> <laughs> I'm still I don't know how to serve yet properly <laughs> but I'm practicing when you perfect that I mean you'll be an absolute game changer yeah, who you, knows you I could, could you box know, once I... every three months and then enter like Wimbledon <laughs> there's only what four majors you can space your boxing in between yeah, who knows? Like, Canelo does golf now doesn't he he does so who knows I could be like the Nadal or something like that what did you do when you played cricket were you a bowler a batsman bowler left arm fast yeah. left arm fast bowler I put up actually funny enough I put up a video the other day on my Instagram of me bowling and all the cricketers um, hit me up and like oh, you can bowl you can you can play I go if you're a Pakistani, it's almost in your DNA, isn't it? Yeah, left arm fast bowler <laughs> yeah. as well. Like, it is like the the absolute Pakistani, uh, the archetypal bowler. That's it. Um, okay, cool. So what's the uh, what's the plan? What, what's the so if you can map out the next ten years of your career, how would you do it? What would you do? Because I'd imagine you are gonna you know, it wouldn't surprise me. You ended up at super middleweight. Like yeah, no, potential. ideally, ideally, I want to win my first title at 160. So whether that be end of this year, early next year, I want it to be soon. Um, then stay at maybe unify in, in an ideal world unify at 160 move up to 168 um, and then ideally finish my career at one maybe 175 or maybe even touching cruiserweight one one day uh, cruiserweight one day who knows so nice. that that would be in an ideal world 10 years takes me to what 34 be done by 34 and then just travel the world <laughs> Have you made like, because I mean, Amir was, was somebody who said throughout his career, I want to retire at this age. Yeah. He never did. But yeah. he said from pretty early on in his career that he yeah. wanted to be done by 29, I think it was. Yeah. Do you have a cutoff date? Do you have other things that you want to kind of go and pursue outside of boxing in the future? In an, in an ideal world, I think I'd like to be done by 35 max. Because I've been, you know, I've been doing it since eight. I turned pro when I was 18. It's gone like as fast as anything already. And I don't know, we'll be sitting here doing a retirement interview one day, maybe, you know what I mean? But 30, 35 max. But I'd always be involved in boxing. Like I've just got my manager's license as well. So I'd li like to manage a few fighters, maybe. But when I say soon, maybe like end of next year, hopefully manage a few fighters while I'm still going on in my career as well. I don't want to do it when I'm done. I'd rather do it and bring them up at the same time as me. So let's see what happens. What kind of motivated you to Because I didn't know that. What yeah. motivated you to do that? Just... It was more, I'd like to help youngsters coming through the way that I, w I, I would like to be in help. You know what I mean, I have someone who's still doing it, but at the same time, while they're still doing it, the knowledge I've learned in, what, six years I've been a pro, just give to the, to the to youngsters coming through and just give them, you got most, not all, I'm not saying all, but most managers nowadays, they're a bit um, not up to date with how social media works nowadays your following just as important as your career. It's not just boxing, boxing, boxing now, is it? You've got to build up a following. Yeah, and yeah. The way you do that via social media is is a total, complete different thing to how it was 10 years ago. Do you know what I mean? Back in the day, what was it? Billboards and newspapers, and now it's all Instagram, Twitter and whatnot. So I just like to give that angle. Do you know what I mean? Help build a profile. So when they've had about, I don't know, 15 fights, they've, they've got a fair few followers behind them as well. That's interesting. I I, I didn't you know, I didn't expect that. I didn't yeah. I didn't know that of you. Just a different insight, isn't it? Yeah. It's not that traditional. Right, you got a manager now. He's just going to message you a, a fight date, and that's it. It's, you'd rather be in touch. That's what I want to do anyway. Be in touch with your fighter, help them grow organically, but at the same time, help them have a big following. Yeah, because uh, as we know as well about kind of the boxing industry and management and things like that, yeah. it's not always. You know, sometimes people don't necessarily have the best interest of the fighter at heart and it's no. them first and yes, the fighter second. Exactly, so yeah. it's always good to hear, you know, fighters who know and have been through it, who've yeah. taken the punches themselves. Exactly. Giving back to people on the way through. Yeah, like I said, I would, and most people that say when, I'm, when I've retired, I want to do it then. So when I'm, I've got time to do this and do that, I'd rather just do it now. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Or who knows what's going to happen next week? So everything I can do in my capability I'll, I'm definitely going to do that and then it'll be interesting to see to see how it goes and who, who, who's the first fighter I'll, I'll sign up there we go any young fighters who are looking for representation we have Hamza Shiraz go. here <laughs> make sure you uh, you hit him up and if you've watched this and you go with him I'm going to get 5% as well there, so you go, there we go yeah, we <laughs> that's on camera by the way as well so we can't go back on that right Hamza yep. real pleasure thanks very much for stopping by today uh, we're going to do a few little fun bits and pieces so yep. make sure you look out for that on one on one boxing but this is the first time we've done one of these hopefully not the last yep. uh, and we can catch up a few more times before we do the big retirement interview in 10 years yeah no for sure thanks for having me Rob
always a pleasure thanks very much for for joining us here at id studios and for joining us for one-on-one -on -one boxing so that's all we have time for with hamza shiraz today make sure you check out one-on-one -on -one boxing for all the little extra bits that we're about to shoot thanks very much i couldn't go to a show without someone calling me a pussy for dodging fabio and me trying to grab him around the neck in the crowd he, he took me to school I can't lie, the, the Ben Shalom picture with me in the push chair. Yeah, it, he's definitely 1 0. Same with David Adelaide, or a little bit different? A little bit different, a bit of a prick. I would definitely enjoy knocking him out. Get a bit more out of knocking him out than I would Fabio, let's put it that way. I got bottled, and then I was punching, and I remember like security coming over, like, I'm like, but you've been stabbed. And I'm like, what?